Hi, this is Paul. And today, I'm sure John will post this on his channel too, probably. Mm -hmm. But uh, John, John, I was going to say John Van Donk. John Verveke and I are going to have another conversation. I posted a video a mm, week or two ago, and John made a comment, said, "Oh, let's let's talk about some of this stuff." And I, I I'm sure that there'll be no no shortage of things for John and I to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was just mentioning that when you know I saw that little snippet of what you had done with Rafe about yeah. non-theism. And I was talking to a Roman Catholic scholar about doing a conversation about that Bishop Barron um, uh, cosmic skeptic conversation. I thought, wow, some of this non-theism yeah. yeah. is, yeah. is very interesting in terms of, let's say, classical theism versus non-theism. And um, yeah, so... <laughs> And, and, and I thought the video was 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 very good, <clears throat> and, and I thought some of the uh, um, of the critique uh, of uh, of some of the stuff the cosmic skeptic was was saying was good. You you had both criticisms, and you also pointed out this is a strong argument. This argument needs to be responded to. I, I thought that was excellent. <clears throat> now, for me also, I've just been reading. I'm reading and and, and purchased a bunch. This book, for example, uh, Mystical Monotheism, a study in ancient Platonic theology uh, by uh, John Peter Kenny is, is ha having a deep impact on the fact that what I thought was classical theism isn't perhaps best called classical theism. This book, uh, The Unknown God, Negative Theology in the Platonic Tradition, Plato to Erigena by Deidre uh, Carabine, uh, which is, and, and then Bishop Barron, um, uh, he, he'd love that I've got this new book, uh, uh, the world is God's icon, creator, and creation in the Platonic thought of Thomas Aquinas. It's all about participation. And then participation in God, a study in Christian doctrine and metaphysics. So I've been trying to be responsible to, you know, that I need a more, more refined and nuanced way of talking about non-theism in contrast to theism. I even proposed in the comment that we, I might need a distinction between what we might call common theism, the kind of post-enlightenment theism that, you know, that was bounced off and bounced with deism and stuff like that, and classical theism in which um, uh, uh, a, a lot of notions uh, that, um, that I, I think are found within the non-theistic religions also get prominent place uh, within what turns out to be uh, frequently orthodox christianity if thomas aquinas isn't orthodox i'm not quite sure who is um and, and, but of course some of these people are also considered heretics erigena for example right. so that stuff sits right for me and, and i and i mean this properly it sits right on the boundary of christianity you know what i mean what's inside and outside um it, it all the, while still going to the core in a lot of ways um and, and, and again, because, you know, Augustine and Dionysus, like these are pretty, you know, orthodox sources for Western Christianity, Eastern Christianity. Anyways, this is a long rambling way of me saying, I want to enter into dialogue about this because I think, uh, you know, I, 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 my, my own thinking needs refinement on this. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll state a, a, a kind of what, I'm, what I want to do. I want to do that. And I want to enter into your excellent discussion around that. And, but what I have a goal that you might not have because part of my allegiance to the idea of non-theism is I wanna be able to talk about, I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll make it more personal. When I left Christianity, my, my, I, and then I found Platonism and Neoplatonism, I found Buddhism and I found Taoism, and these, they did things for me and they continue to do things for me. They, I, the, the, the best analogy I can have is they're some of my best friends and I have a tremendous loyalty to them. And, and, and I, I won't sort of go into any position that requires me to take up a kind of disloyalty to them or a denigration of what they have done or continue to do for me. And part of my allegiance to non-theism, and I don't think my, my situation is in any way, you know, unique or special. I think there's lots of people in that boat. And so part of what I want to do with the non-theism is be able to talk about the sacred in a way that maintains that loyalty to Neoplatonism, uh, to Buddhism and Taoism. Now, of course, one of the advantages is Neoplatonism also has a long history with Christianity, which right. makes such a dialogue possible. So I just wanted to put some of my cards on the table of what I'm looking for, but, you know, and one of the goals that will, I, that I have in mind. 
Well, and I'll put some of my cards on the table too. I mean, I, I started, I mean, when I first started making videos, at least these monologue videos, not just the Freddie and Paul show, um, but one of the, and I didn't even have the conceptual framework to know why I was feeling that the world had changed. And, and Ascension Day, of course, was for me a big puzzle because Jesus goes up. Okay. But obviously the world has changed dramatically since Galileo. Yes. You know, the heavens don't start <laughs> at the moon. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I realized that I, I continue for my occupation to try to contextualize the Bible to a 21st century group of people whose world is very different from the one within the Bible. Mm -hmm. That led me to, you know, and I saw with Jordan's work, you know, somebody, at least I intuitively had a sense that there's something going on here that he's playing around with modernity and, you know, he's trying to bring old things in. And so that was interesting. But, but then when I listened to him talk to Sam Harris, it became, it became very clear that the world that Sam Harris was living in and the world that Jordan Peterson was living in, in terms of, he can't almost even knew what God was, what they meant by this word God, yes, between Sam yes. Harris and Jordan Peterson was, were very different things. And some of the stuff that I had heard out of Jordan in that conversation with Sam Harris reminded me of some of the earliest Reformation confessions and how they talked about God. Mm -hmm. And as a minister, I would... So those are my confessional statements within the Christian Reformed Church. And then I would listen to just regular people share their experience, characterize God, relate to God. And there was there was a big difference. And that's sort of where I came up with God number one and God number two, because yes, they were sort good. of buckets and yeah. empty placeholders for me to sort of compare and contrast. And then as I listened to your stuff, I mean, you began to give me more categories to work with like a two worlds mythology mm -hmm. and um, you know, the agent arena relationship. I had yeah. already had, you know, general revelation and natural revelation. I had already had imminence and transcendence. And so you had all these dualities that were sort of floating on out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had never, despite having had obviously courses in theology in seminary and had, you know, read plenty of books on theology, I, I probably hadn't taken a step back and and done some more classical thinking about what we mean by this word, because the yep. word was very much defined by Christian practice, the Christian mm -hmm. community. And of course, everything that we're reading from the ancient world is in many ways, you know, then framed by the contemporary stuff. And so you don't really yeah. break that. And then it wasn't until, you know, I had the God number one, God number two thing going, and then talking, reading this book by um, Brett Sockold, Transubstantiation, that, you know, my eyes began to be open about, and then reading this book by a Hebrew scholar, Ezekiel Kaufman, who, mm -hmm. who you know, he, he asked some questions that I had never thought of. You know, I've, I've got a seminary education, I'm not really a classicist you know, why isn't there in the Bible a mythology about the beginnings of God? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and so he basically works on those kinds of things. And, and so, you know, then, then the meta divine realm and why, how the Hebrews sort of replace the meta divine realm with their God and how that then works with some of these categories and actually, this week I'm preaching on Acts 17 with Paul on Mars Hill, oh. and now seeing that passage very much through Kaufman's categories, and you know this conversation that that you have brought to me in terms of because when you talk about non-theism, what that does is help me sort of I don't want to use say deconstruct because that leads us down a different road, but sort of <laughs> help me try to see the Hebrew scriptures, mm, mm. the history of the church. What on earth do we mean by this word? And, you know, with that little clip between you and Rafe, it was quite clear that your non-theism helps get you out of this impasse. 
this that we're yeah. currently in. That, that's that's the intent. I I want to make it clear to people who are watching that people that I would call atheists have now started adopting for themselves the term non-theism, which is really problematic because we we need a term uh, other than atheist for what I'm trying to talk about. And traditionally, that term has been non-theism, like Buddhists and Taoists will describe their their view as a non-theistic view. And describing it as atheism is to, 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 uh, to fundamentally <clears throat> misrepresented in, in important ways to my mind. Um, so I just want to warn people that there are books out there that are now um, using the word non-theism where we, until very recently, we would have used the word atheism. Um, so, and, and that's an odd and interesting trend. And I want to try and figure out what's going on there as well. Why that shift and what is it they're trying to do? Um, part of it is that they're trying to say that it's not a position, it's just the denial of another position. Um, and and, and I, I think that's a very problematic thing to say. Um, so at some point, maybe I could lay out what I mean by non-theism. Yeah, please do. Just, just to be clear. Um, and, and like I said, uh, I, I'm really open to negotiating who the contrast class is. So I, I, I <laughs> right, I, I really am. I, <clears throat> And so what I what I was trying to do with non theism was to try and get at the shared presuppositions that I found within the current debate. So that's part of the stipulation the, the current set of people who self designate as theists and the people who self designate uh, as atheists and who get sort of center stage in, in social media, uh, the public domain. Um, now, of course, I've got to qualify that because as I've come to uh, no Bishop Barron, but he doesn't cleanly fall into uh, some of the categories I was using. So again, th that's part of why I want to talk to you about this. But how I posed it was, what are the shared presuppositions between the, the, the common theists and the common atheists, if I can put it that way. Um, and, and I'm trying not to use common in, in, a, in an insulting way. I'm just trying to just designate that group. And, th and this is, of course, a very prominent thing. And so, and what I was saying is that the non-theist argues that the theist and the atheist agree on an important set of presuppositions that frame our relationship to the transformative power of sacredness. Um, and, and they do that by taking, I make a distinction between sacredness and the sacred, and maybe we can talk about that at some point. Um, and, and that for, for me and, other people like Rafe, who I'm talking to, we want to we want to reject the framework, the shared set of presupposition. And the basic idea is the theist says yes to all of them, and the atheist says no to all of them. And the non-theist says this is kind of this is a bit Kinshinian move. Move. This is like asking what time is it on the sun, and you've got people disagreeing about what time it is on the sun without realizing that they're framing that exactly the wrong way. It doesn't make any sense to ask that question, what time is it on the sun, right? Um, and what you have to do is see that the presuppositions are inappropriate to the phenomena. That was one of Wittgenstein's continual moves. Realize that's the bewitchment of language, right? That the, the presuppositions that go into your problem formulation, your question generation, are sometimes the problem. And we need a kind of insight to break out of them. And so the non-theist is trying to break out of this and, and says, and, and, and then is recommending that breaking out of that framework is actually existentially, psycho-existentially uh, important because it allows and affords people to come into a more vital and living relationship to sacredness. And that's the, the main proposal of non-theism. And the idea is that aligns with non-theistic traditions within the West, like the Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition, and right religions that, when I, you know, often frequently self-designate as non-theist, like Buddhism and Taoism. So that's what I that's what I'm trying to mean by this term. I was fascinated by your. Um, your the transformative power of sacredness yes um, can you can you flesh that out a little bit more yes so uh, um I, I was just talking to jim rudd about this this morning so this is something I, I i'm i'm thinking about a lot today so first of all i make a distinction and before anybody jumps on me i can point within the tradition and the christian tradition to say this distinction has already been made and i think schleiermacher was attempting to make it 
uh, with his, he was trying to get where, when we're talking about sacredness is we're talking about a psycho uh, existential, and, and I, there's not, there isn't a single noun here I wanna put after the adjective. It's something like experience, realization, transformation. People have these experiences, realizations, transformations that strike them as uh, importantly profound and comprehensive. Um, they don't have to be sudden. Um, and, and that these experience and denying that these experiences occur is just false. I mean, 40% of the population has them regardless of religious affiliation, denying that they have the real potential to transform identities and lives is also just false. And so, you know, and Schleiermacher tried to say, you know, when he's defending religion, he tried to say, put aside the metaphysics, let's talk about, you know, this sense of dependence, right? And he tried to, he tried to shift it onto what I would call sacredness, the, this, and again, there isn't one word to cover it. It's, and so I'm loop, loop, linking these three words together, experience, realization, transformation. And the idea here is that uh, people have these experiences, realizations, transformations, and I want to talk about that with this word sacredness. That's what I'm trying to use and, 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 what, and, and, and acknowledge the reality of this and, and the real value of it to human lives, both individually and collectively, and that this is, and, you know, of course, I was going to mention this at some point, to my mind, coming into a having a proper framework by which people can come into right relationship with sacredness is integral to addressing the meaning crisis. Now there's another term, which is the sacred, and I'll try to use these terms consistently, but even in the, uh, the video episode, I, I slip. The sacred is some kind of metaphysical ontological proposal as to what is the cause of, of sacredness, right? The reason why sacredness happened was because of X, right? And of course, there's lots of variation on what that proposal is. So when I'm talking about sacredness, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, what one of the things I'm proposing, although I'm really happy to discuss it with you, and you know that, um, I'm proposing that non-theism has a, a flexible stance towards the answer as to what the sacred is, uh, that is allows uh, for more recognition of right relationship to sacredness, especially in other religions, et cetera. And the second point, non-theism says that what it's trying to do, and I haven't made this clear, but I, so I wanna make it clear here now. Non-theism says that we, 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 although these experiences are happening here in this, we've, tend to, we've tended to create, I don't know what to call them, Paul, and so I'm gonna use this term and I don't mean any insult or specification, but we've tended to create orthodoxies, I don't know if that's the right word, right, in which we we say the, the we give the we get it we give an answer to the sacred and that then constrains our interpretation of sacredness. The non theist the non theist is recommending going the other way. Let's get the best phenomenological functional account of sacredness and use that to constrain the answers we give to the sacred. That's the proposal. Okay. I thought that was that was that was very good and very clear. And I think it's helpful to especially what you what you just said at the end there, like. Like in many in many ways, part of part of what we're trying to do at this point, this is post it historically. Oh boy, there's so much there's so much I've been talking about lately. I'll see if I can I can summarize it. I mean, part of how we arrive at this in the West is certainly partly through pluralism. Mm -hmm. That with mm -hmm. globalization, the world has opened up. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we're looking for language that can recognize this phenomenological, um, and I like, I think you have three good words, experience, realization, transformation, mm -hmm. that, um, that, that is, that you see happening in many different cultures in many different places in the world. Yes. You know, obviously once, once, once Europe at the, at the Columbian exchange, when in a sense, you really have the beginning of globalization after Columbus, you know, now you have the Americas and then you, then you have the connection to Asia, you know, you have the whole thing going on. Now, suddenly groups are within recorded history at a different level. Obviously these kinds of, these kind of contacts had been made prior to yes. the Columbian exchange. We just have very little documentation of them. And because we don't have a lot of documentation, we don't have a lot of um, material to sort of analyze, but, 
all of now suddenly Christians and Buddhists and eventually this this you know because of the British colonial situation you have Hinduism because the yeah. British need a name for yeah whatever yeah. it is these Indians are doing <laughs> yeah and you know all all around the world now there's this there's this human there's this human experience human phenomena of transformation mm-hmm. and well how does that then how does that then converse with um, the the kinds of exclusive claims that develop in Judaism Christianity and Islam yes and and so there's you know there's going to have to be a conversation between these and so i think again it's helpful to recognize that the direction that we're working from here is starting from the bottom. Now, yes. this, this for someone like myself as a Christian minister, in a time and place where many people like yourself, whether people do it when they're young or people do it when they're old, they're leaving a religious community, no. uh, a set of religious practices, beliefs, um, values, and they're going out. And, and usually, usually when they do so, part of what prompts them is either a, usually a combination of um, this, this no longer works for me, which is language mm-hmm. we put on something to sort of get a rough estimate there's, that there's an intuitive sense of dis-ease, dissatisfaction, mm-hmm. the everything in my world isn't lining up and we can use McGilchrist's um, we can use McGilchrist's schema that, you know, one side of the brain is looking at the other and saying, well, you're not really happy. So let's come to a conclusion that not this, but then suddenly (laughs) what about these other things? Because we notice transformations happen in people. And I think also with McGilchrist's idea, well, once we notice that transformations are happening, one hemisphere is going to say, okay, let's, let's try to organize and systematize. And, and this is where you're going to have orthodoxies emerge, even outside of traditions, yes, yes. where, where things will begin to develop. And then we're going to have to seek around, you know, look for language and somehow gain orientation with respect to these things. And so, you know, I, I thought it very helpful in, as you just did right now, and as you did with Rafe Kelly, with um, an experience, realization, and transformation. Okay, we, we see that these transformations happen in people. Yes. Even if we are roughly unclear about how these transformations line up, let's say all the way from top to bottom, but just mm-hmm. sort of here in this buffered secular space, we can see in a person that they're, okay, they're a little happier. And I love the language you used in the awakening from the meaning crisis. Let's use agency, either reciprocal narrowing yes. or reciprocal broadening. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so we can see that, let's say someone has say deconstructed from Christianity or they've made a move that, that, we, that sort of crosses lines that have been around for a long time. And we see a transformation has taken place. And generally speaking, just within a little time frame, we look and we say, hmm, there seems to be some reciprocal broadening here. They've yes. got a little bit more joy. They've got a little bit better sense of identity. They've got a little bit more energy and agency. And you know, now that that obviously is within time frames something that we hold a little bit of humility with because yes. what what sometimes we have a little bit of a transformation and we think, oh, this is going to be a good thing. And then within days or yes. weeks or even years, we bump into something and realize, oh, this you know, it's kind of going through a maze. I hit an end wall and now I have to backtrack. So it's helpful just to locate this in that frame, especially within the secular sphere, where, as I say, often we don't, we don't have stars to guide us, partly because of a lot of what has happened in the West over the last 500 years to say, I'm not going to make a huge number of ultimate claims and mm-hmm. people, people deal with, use, use this kind of language, well, for me or for now or for us or within this tradition, we're always trying to locate things. Say, I'm not going to make my claim to ultimate, even mm-hmm. though I think at some point we have to deal with the ultimate and I we agree. will jump yeah. there. Yeah. But we're here in, this tra- in these transformations, we can say, 
hmm, I might not be able to connect that to the ultimate, but for now, it seems an improvement. That, yeah, that... you dead reckoning metaphor. Exactly. Right? Right, right, and and I would I would I would buttress that by saying, you know, there's increasing empirical evidence, you know, that people uh, and, and and atheists have had these higher states of consciousness experiences. I've read books and reports, and and they, and they and they lead to these kinds of transformations. And importantly, uh, these transformations, <coughs> like like they they're by by objective measures and by asking other people. I I, I relate one in some of my videos about I've been doing. Tai Chi Chuan religiously uh, uh, for like about uh, two or three years. And I've been having all these amazing phenomenological experiences, days where I was as hot as fire and I had to do Tai Chi practically naked and days when I'm cold as ice and all the, and I'm getting into the flow state and all of that's happening. But then my, my friends in graduate school came up to me and said, what's going on with you? And I was like, what do you mean? Well, you're, you're way different than you used to be. You're much more balanced when you're arguing and you're much more empathetic and picking up, you're much more flexible. And, you're, and I realized, oh, wow, the Tai Chi Chuan is permeating in my life and percolating through my psyche in ways I'm not recognizing, but other people are recognizing. And when you get, and I, in fact, I often recommend, I often say to my students, how do you know, they say, how do I know I'm doing it right? And I said, when other people notice a change in you, that's when you notice you, that's when you know there's nothing inside the experience that's going to work for you to do that and so you can get you can get reports by other people you can get more objective reports about right and and Yaden's work and a whole bunch of people like right like yeah these things happen they happen on a spectrum of belief and yet they reliably not perfectly but they reliably produce long-standing improvements People have a mystical experience, the Griffith lab. People have a mystical experience and they have long-standing change in the personality trait of openness. That is a re that's not supposed to change. In fact, it's supposed to go down with time gradually. And in fact, it's open and it stays open. That's a real significant measurable change. And we like if we're gonna be if we're gonna be scientific about this, not scientific, if we're gonna be scientific about this. We have to acknowledge that, and we have to take it into um, we have to take it into account. Now, I'm interested in both the science of what's going on there, but I'm also inter interested in but how do we enter into right relationship? The existential question: How do we how do we frame this undeniable phenomena such that we right, we make it appropriately available to people? That's the thing that I'm concerned with, and. I happen to think that the language, uh, the, well, the language of common theism and atheism and the presuppositions don't do a good job of that. That's the main argument I'm making. Yeah, and I, I and I agree with that. Now, once we have now, once we've agreed to transformations, and that these transformations, and again, as a Christian pastor, I can see that this is these things can be very messy. Yes, in terms yeah. of people's lives. Yes. Because people, of course, are situated in in yes. structures yes. and communities. Yep. And so, as you well know, to leave a community, you know, with a faith tradition is a very, it's a very difficult thing. And that's, that's part of the reason, actually, that I'm not um, skeptical about the power and importance and relevance of transformations, because people don't take such risky, costly steps unless there is something powerful driving them. Yeah, and you see this in the tradition. The Buddha leaves the palace and his family. We, we, like, you, you have to stop and pause on that. For many of us, that's in him. I mean, leaving the palace, oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, he also leaves his wife and his, his young kid. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And Jesus, you know, you have to leave your father and your mother, right? And if you can't do that, you can't follow me. And, oh, no, Jesus doesn't. Jesus didn't say that. Well, yeah, he did. And you got, like, what does he mean? Right. And, and that, that I, I'm agreeing with you. And I think you see in all of these traditions, the recognition that, this, yeah, this, this is not like some little, woo, this is like, it, like it, it, like it ripples through people's lives and identities in profound ways that are disruptive and can be hurtful to other people. And, and, and then also we have to recognize that these transformations scale yes. in that 
we will have, you know, for right now, there's in at least in the United States, there's a lot of younger people who are leaving the Christian church. Yeah. That then has um, impacts, obviously, on their peers, has impacts on institutions, has impacts in politics. And, you know, I really loved what you said at the beginning of the, I wasn't able to stay the whole time, but the question and answer for the awakening from the meaning crisis, talking about, you know, this this powerful movement that, you know, it, it's, it always, when I would, whenever I read John's letters or um, the letters to the churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation, they're absolutely audacious because they're telling these tiny little struggling communities that you will overcome Babylon, which is an <laughs> audacious thing to write at the beginning of the first yeah, century. Yeah, and yeah. then by the, the fourth century, it happens. And yes, it's like, exactly. wow. So, so part of the part of the question for me is obviously okay because I walk with people as they go through transformations. Yes. And that community and not just a community because everybody in the community is going to bring their own idiosync in the idiosyncratic thing, but again as a leader in a community as someone who is let's say ordained in a church as a who's a pastor so as a shepherd, I walk with people in transformations and sometimes those transformations are out of the church sometimes those yep. transformations are into the church yes. it's part of the reason of my estuary project that i'm involved with um and and so it's it's helpful to remember or it's helpful to continue the conversation understanding two things number one because when i you know lately i've been talking about the upper and lower register right when you undergo a transformation i think sort of the upper half of the two world mythology in a person must sort of tie it to the you know existentials to the to the ultimates to the absolutes it, yeah. it's just sort of what we do and another factor you know sort of your um uh it's not reciprocal it's it's the two opponent, opponent processing, opponent so, processing. It's, so on one hand the absolute pulls us and on the other hand, the contextual pushes us. Yes. And yes. so, but, you know, th those tensions are always there in there, in us. And so part of the bigger conversation in the midst of continual transformations are, okay, how can we assess? How can we sort of dead reckon from below? We're watching these transformations. What does that tell us about the ultimate? And what, yes. and because we're, I think we're always doing this. I agree. I, I don't think we can't. I agree. And, and so there's two points I want to make uh, in connection with that. One is um, the, these experience, uh, these experience of uh, uh, these experiences, realizations, transformation, sacredness, right. Um, is, is, is often bound up with, this is more real, the autonormativity. This is more real, and that's exactly it's that that's the motivating force. And this is one of Plato's great insights, uh, to my mind. Um, and 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 and, the, and that's related to the next point I want to make, which is a, a contra Cartesian point, which is the realization that these transformations disclose truths that are not accessible before the transformation. And you have the whole problem of transformative experience that L.A. Paul talks about and Agnes Callard, the the idea that. And this is why I want to use the word realization. Reality discloses itself in ways it previously didn't or couldn't. Um, and, and that starts to get you, like you start to wonder in the proper sense of the word wonder about, well, what is real? And I don't mean as a cafe, you know, philosophical discussion as you smoke a cigarette. You like you feel, if you feel autonormativity, you start to really, you start to wonder, but what's really real? What, like, when I go through this transformation and I realize, and, and, and it's not just me transforming, it's the world transforming, the reciprocal opening, you, you start to, you, you, like the question about the profundity of the sacredness raises the question about, well, how, like, what is the most profoundly real to me? Uh, what is it that's affording and driving the realization if you'll allow me, and I'm putting this in quotes for a reason, from, from the side of the world. The world is also participating in this in some fashion. And you start to wonder about 
the ontology of the world, if I, if, to use a rather jargony way of putting it, but that, that's what starts, and that's what these people uh, typically do do. And uh, like, uh, Comp Spoonville, he's an atheist and he has a mystical experience. And he says, you know, it, it made him try to, it made him think about, well, what, like, what does this, what, what's going on? Like, how can I, how, like, what is, is this, is this just, is this just sort of some sort of brain burp or like, is it, is it doing something? And if, and if I rule out this experience, but it's like insight and insight seems to be a driver of us discovering things in science and in art and in literature. So, and that's what I've been trying to do with the cognitive continuum hypothesis. Like, like, well, if you reject this and you realize it's the same machinery that's at work in flow and in insight you're, and in wondering, like you're, you're putting yourself in a really dangerous position. So I would argue that th those two things, right? Really like sacredness draws you towards it. And the fact that you, like, the transformation is reciprocal, right? And, and, and we realize, wait, when I transform, I, uh, the world discloses in ways it didn't before. And if I transform more, more such disclosure could occur. And that disclosure, I'm finding that disclosure intrinsically good. It's making me and my life better. So I should transform more. But what does that mean? Those questions come up and the, the whole issue of how do I follow a path of transcendence, um, I think comes to, I'm not, I'm not saying it comes to the fore for everybody, but it's highly probable it will come to the fore for most people. Uh, absolutely. And now you and I are, you know, on the, on the scale of things, quite cosmopolitan. We, you know, we, we in a sense, are always conscious of the of the pluralisms around us and we have relationships across those pluralisms and so that in many ways we, we take on language of we take in very measured language i mean that's sort of the culture of of the cosmopolitan class but if i you know of course having been a christian missionary working in african-american context working in church context what you just described is absolutely the case with Christian conversion, because mm. when someone converts, their entire world changes. And one of the things that you notice in a church, there'll usually be people who sort of inherit it, and then people who convert it. And the converts are almost always more zealous. Yeah. And, yes. you know, sometimes given to certain dogmatisms and absolutisms, yeah. because of exactly the dynamic that you just, you just yes. noted. Yes. Where, you know, I love to use the illustration of Chuck Colson, who, you know, Chuck Colson was Richard Nixon's hatchet man. Yes. And he was known as just a cutthroat um, uh, political operative who would do anything for his boss. And then he begins, it's, it's, it's nicely documented in his book, Born Again. You know, he begins to realize that, you know, he's doing anything for his boss, but his boss is going to leave him hanging out to dry. Which happened. Which, yeah, which is exactly what happened. And there's this group of, you know, deeply evangelical people in Washington, D.C. And, you know, at one point, I, I paraphrase this, this isn't exactly, he, he records the moment in his book, but basically he goes home and he tells his wife, you know, I've become a Christian. And she's like, I thought we were Episcopalians. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because, you know, at that point, of course, for Chuck Colson, he has this religious, he has this, you know, religious transformation and his entire life change. And of course, then he's going to go to jail and in prison then, obviously, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost sent, okay, you're going to become a monk sent to you by the United States government. You're going to live in a cell. You're going to spend yeah. time by yourself. You're going to have a new community around you of people who are also in cells. And of course, for, for Chuck Colson, that launches prison fellowship and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I want to, you know, I, when I use illustrations, I always try to use illustrations. If people in the, in the one side tend to be lean this way, I like using an illustration from the other political camp. Of course. Because it, it helps us recognize the, the commonality here in terms of these transformations. But then, of course, over time, you know, we, I think we're always also, as human beings, both individually and communally, checking. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. I did this transformation. I, you know, whether I, whether I speak them or not, I've got intuitions of the absolute. 
and uh, I've got it and I'm seeing the world in an entirely new way. Yes. Am I fooling myself? And, and I, you should. You yes, should ask. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, 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 and you can't reason yourself. The, 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 and this is L.A. Paul's point. You can't reason your way through a transformation and you can't go back to what made sense before the transformation as your normative base. And so you, you really are in a dangerous place. And, and, and I see, you know, literature within Christianity and Buddhism and Taoism warning about this. Right. And, and, and it's often, you know, uh, given certain mythological ways, different for the culture. But there's this. Yeah, there's like there's there, there is a, exactly that. Um, uh, so, um, uh, for me, that's why I've argued, and, and this is, this is an, uh, this is an inter a hermeneutic exegetical claim. I claim that all of these traditions have said those transformations have to be bound up with the aspiration to wisdom, right? The, where wisdom, again, doesn't mean being logical. It means this systematic attempt to system, to systemically intervene in one's cognition, to reduce self-deception, both individual and collectible, collective, and enhance meaning in life, right? And and for me, that's again, for me, that's that's that that's quintessential uh, to what I want to what what I want to talk about. And I want to again recognize, again, my loyalty to the these 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 other traditions, these traditions that call them non-theists, and the way they have helped coordinate that for me. The training of wisdom through mindfulness in Buddhism, the training of wisdom through flow um, in Taoism, um, and that helped me do that, coordinate the transformation with, I'm not claiming to be wise, that's ridiculous, but an improvement in, you know, in wisdom. Uh, and of course, the Socratic Neoplatonic tradition um, has been just essential for me and continues to be. Now, the exciting thing for me and, uh, is that I see some important, and this was your point, which is why I'm so excited about your video, when you compare me to, you know, Bishop Barron, and, 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 and the bishop was basically giving the Neoplatonic position. I, I, that's very fair uh, to say, and, and, and to realize how big of a role the Neoplatonic tradition played within officially Orthodox Christianity and also on the edges of Christianity, right? And so... I see a big, I, I see a deep similarity between that and a lot of what I'm talking about, what I'm seeing and what I got from Buddhism and Taoism in terms of why, uh, of wise transformation. I, 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 sorry, this isn't meant to be insulting, but I see deep similarities between the Neoplatonic tradition that was taken into orthodoxy and the Neoplatonic tradition that was outside and remained non-theist, and also these non-theist other religions. Other people have noted that, that the Kyoto School is big for noting that, the Suzuki noted, the deep connections between, like the deep similarities between Zen and Eckhart, and you know, and Heidegger picked up on that. I won't go on about that. I'm not the only person making this observation, but the, uh, the, the, the realization that I was making a mistake and attributing all the way back a certain model of theism that is a post-deist model of theism. That was a mistake on my part. And the part, and so I'm very excited about what you did. And you, you're basically, like if you'll allow me to paraphrase, like John, look, right? What you're talking about in non-theism, there's, there's something very analogous that's gone on in what we, we should, and this is what Kenny argues, what is properly called classical theism, the theism of the classical world. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that's bang on. And I, 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 I want to, I want to I want to sink my teeth into that. There's some that's a like thank you for that first of all. And, but there's I, I there's ah, there's some there, I want to open it up. There's something very powerful and important going on there. Well, and I think I think part of so so again for me as a Christian when I I've often told people I am not necessarily tremendously bothered by watching people deconstruct from Christianity mm -hmm. because yes, yes. sometimes sometimes the Christianity they are deconstructing should really be deconstructed 
<laughs> and and all huge traditions like this all have their nooks and crannies and better and worse yeah, and all yeah, of that. Yeah. And so yes. I know, um, you know, there's and and, and it's, it is natural to a religious tradition to have a to have a tribal energy to it. And that's yeah. because we, we need identity. We need community yes. and we need those frontiers and boundaries. And so, you know, I don't apologize for that. But, but part of what interested me, and again, it's been a, a real journey for me over these last three years, is to recognize, to, to ask harder questions about why, in some sense, classical theism was lost, yes. and what kinds of theism are, have been expressed by the church, and, you know, and this is sort of where I'd, you know, where Jonathan Peugeot is someone to play with, because on one hand, through him, I can access some more of these classical things because orthodoxy yeah. is really good at preserving stuff. They don't change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, the new things that come down the road usually come down the road for a reason. Yeah. And, and so when I, so on That's, one hand, yeah, yeah. you know, you've got a guy who's a, he's a, he's a Roman Catholic Bishop, you know, so yeah. he's, yeah. And he's not some Rando protestant pastor with an internet connection is a roman catholic bishop and you know very well educated um you know tremendously well informed and so what i've seen in a lot of this and what i saw immediately why was jordan i mean the the amazing thing about those first few years of the jordan peterson phenomena was i was in just in looking at people thinking wow transformations significant transformations are yes. happening in people yes. who are watching Jordan Peterson videos. That's interesting. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and I can add to that. I, I, I mean, I'm not claiming to be Jordan Peterson or anything like that, but I get a lot of those emails. I get a lot of those comments. I get a lot of those reflections from people about my work. Yep. Um, and, 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 and that, uh, and, and, you know, you and I talk, people have, have, have said that I'm a better Christian than, than, than any great, and, like, and I don't know what to do without that. No matter what I say, it's going to be insulting. Uh, uh, right. But I, I want to somehow acknowledge that and, and, and you know, and be appropriately, uh, you know, grateful for the kindness and the encouragement that is behind that act. But the actual proposition, I don't know what to do with. Yeah. Um, so, the the thing for me is like I wanted. I, I, let, let me pick up on a, a specific thing that was in that video. It was also in the discussion that Bishop Barron and Jordan, uh, Jonathan Peugeot and, and uh, Jordan Peterson and I had. I'm really I'm really happy and proud about that. I really want that to come out, uh, and I think we all do. Uh, Bishop Barron tweeted a long time ago about, and Jonathan was like, uh, he, Jonathan and I actually recorded a follow-up uh, conversation that's going to come out once it's released. Oh, we're good, all excited. Good. We're all excited about it. But th and this came up in, in the video that you made, and I want because I want to I want to zero in on a concrete example so people can get get clear about what we're talking about. Okay, so you know I you know I came I was educated about you know the onto theological critique of Heidegger. And Heidegger's, one of his main arguments was, you know, we have misunderstood being uh, in terms of, uh, the, of a, a supreme being that is the cause of beings. And that's just a fundamental category mistake. And that category mistake actually cuts us off from participating in being, capital B, and that's the history of nihilism. Now, that's, you know, that's a profound argument. It's a profound point. And I'd always taken it. Uh, because I was brought up this way, that what theism meant was the idea of a supreme being. And then I hear, you know, and I knew from, I knew from the Neoplatonic tradition, the criticisms of that, and, but I hear a bishop who's speaking on behalf of Thomas Aquinas, <clears throat> you know, saying, well, no, that's just a fundamental mistake. Thinking of God as a being is just, God is not the supreme being. That doesn't make any sense. That's a category mistake. He was making Heidegger's argument. And I thought, Wow, that's really interesting. And then he's making that argument from the very neo Neoplatonic tradition. Now, for me, that was it was like one of the things that I see common theism and atheism arguing about is whether or not there is a supreme being. Right. And and 
And to me, the non-theist says, that's just the wrong question. You're trying to get at the ultimate nature of reality being and the ground of being, to use Tillich's phrase, and you're just making a category mistake, both of you. The answer isn't yes or no. It's like, that's, the, that's like asking what's north of the North Pole. You're asking the wrong question. And so for me, that I'm just trying to give a specific example. I have other things that I would, for me, right? And I, I, this is very much a move made in Buddhism. The gods are irrelevant. They might exist. Who cares? They're irrelevant because they're not ultimate in this proper proper way. Or the or the discovery of the difference between immortality and eternity within Greek philosophy. When the Greek philosophers realized that the Greek gods were only immortal and not eternal, this was like, right, right, that sort of thing. And it's like ah, right. And then I hear Bishop Barron saying, oh yeah, well, then blah blah blah. Of course, you know. And I knew Aquinas, I'd read it, but, 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 you know, the, but for me, that Platonic tradition had sort of been lost in the Catholicism that I had seen too. Yeah. But he, no, God is not, God is the ocean of being, right? To use one of Aquinas's beautiful phrases. Um, and, and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. He's clearly a bishop, so he's got to obey uh, like a, a, an orthodox structure, right? He can't just say stuff willy nilly because he's a bishop, but he's he's getting by and he's and he's doing it astutely. I don't agree with everything he says, but that made an impact on me. It was like, wow, here's somebody basically saying, yes, the ontotheological critique is right, and common theism and common atheism are both wrong. And he was trying to get that point across. It wasn't being the I forget the name of the guy who's the cosmic skeptic. He, he wasn't getting that point. He just yeah, wasn't yeah, getting yeah, that yeah, point yeah. Uh, in a profound way. And, and, and so that's what I mean about, for me, that's sort of a defining feature of what I call non-theism, that we don't, there isn't a proposal that the sacred, not sacredness, that the sacred is the supreme being. There, there's no, no, it's being, which is properly understood, and this is the Buddhist meaning of it, as no thingness. But that same language is in the Christian tradition, too. It's yep. in Dionysus. Yep. It's in Eregina. It's in Maximus, right? That language is all the way. It's in Nicholas of Cusa, all the, and I'm reading these people a lot. And so for me, it was that, I'm sorry, I'm going on about this, but I'm trying to get how this, like, it, it, it made a significant impact on me. Well, and, and I think that's, it made an impact on me when I first began to see it, and I began to then connect dots with language that I grew up in, even um, Reformation period confessions, right. I began to notice the, if not the language as such, let's say just a generation apart from that language was still pointing to it. Yes. And you could see that in the attributes of God, let's say, which of course I was trained in as, you know, within the the Reformation context, then the, and for me, where this gets very interesting in terms of, because for me, for me, what you just described is the reawakening of God, number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what had happened, I think, in after, especially deism, when we conceptualized, we, we sort of were able to conceptualize the physical universe as kind of a replacement, laws of physics, kind yeah. of a replacement to God, that, that aspect of God, and sort of the arena, then what gets accentuated is the God number two, the agent. Mm, yes. And because, yes. and, be, and so, and one of the things I also began to notice is, this is where I get into Pascal and the spirit of finesse. Yes. We, we can really, as, as human beings, the only way we can relate to the arena so often is via person. And because it's, it's you know, C.S. Lewis's his greatest novel, which he wrote with Joy Davidman, was Till We Have Faces. Yes, yes. It, and, it is. I read it. It's a beautiful book. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, I remember reading it, and I read it a couple of times, and it's, I just had to kind of get my mind around the problem of why why you can't see the god you know why, why can't you see the god now this is very much if someone's deep in god number two and sort of out of balance it's all it's all agentic 
Well, an yeah. arena is going to fill in over time. You can't help. You're not going to have agents uh, who are completely yeah. without arenas. And, and so when I, when I look at this, you know, I began to notice with the Christian atheist arguments that this was, it was all about God number two. Well, you're, it's all about the agent, God as agent. Yes. And, and so then the atheist sort of punt, you know, when Bishop Aaron sort of puts it back on him and says, well, how do you deal with suffering? And they, they have no, they have no answer. You have and no they, answer. And, yeah, they have no answer. Uh, you get sort of often tepid versions of in of enlightenment in, in the in the in the historical sense of modernity the uh, you, you get well you know we'll improve people's lives etc um and let's be clear that did make a difference people's lives were made better but it but but there, it was not without significant cost and we're bearing that cost i keep telling people remember nietzsche didn't say god is dead to the believers he said it to the atheists Right, you have to. You the, the great prophet of this has to be taken. Uh, I, I mean, prophet in the biblical sense, and that's how he saw himself. I would argue. Um, you, we have to take very seriously what he's point. Like, how did we do this? How did we take a sponge and erase the sky? We are now forever falling. How do we do this? And 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 and, and you know, and the atheists are all sort of tittering and laughing at him, and he he abandons them and he goes into the church and he 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 wants to sing a funeral dirge for God's death. Right, because we have to become worthy of this event. Um, and so, wh wh why am I why am I, I saying all that? It's like if you like if you make God the ultimate subject, I think you're saying the same thing. Then objectivity hangs free. That's the Earth now disconnected from the Sun, and he's using Neoplatonic imagery there. By the way, it's funny how much uh, these people are influenced. Camus wrote his thesis on Neoplatonism. Christian Neoplatonism. Wow. Yeah, wow. wow is the right word. That's why light is so powerful in, in The Stranger, right? <clears throat> and why he describes absurdity in terms of lucidity and light and all kinds of things like that. Anyways, I think I'm saying the same thing as you. If you make if you make God the ultimate subject, objectivity swings free. And then you also have no way of relating the two together, right? There's no way, and there's no... And, and, and for me, Descartes epitomizes this, the Cartesian split. I recommend that people should read a lot more Spinoza. Carlyle's uh, recent book, Spinoza's, Spinoza's Religion, best book I've ever read on Spinoza. And she really makes clear, uh, 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 and that's why I bought these books, by the way, these, book on, these books on participation. Spinoza was really trying to stop that. And, and, and he was really trying to steer away from deism in a very powerful way. I'm not saying he had the answer, but it's, it's like there's a lot going on there that's really profound. Well, that makes perfect so, sense because it's right at that, historically, he's right at that point. And he's in Holland where yes. Cartesianism and Calvinism are right like this together. Right. <clears throat> so he's right at the pivot point and he's basically, so I would present to you the proposal that Spinoza is a great non-theist in the way I've been trying to talk about. Hmm. And what he's trying to do um, is he's trying to do the reverse. He's trying to, he's trying to properly, I'm, I'm looking for a verb here, Paul. Uh, he's trying to translate with all the sort of hermeneutic sense to that word. He's trying to translate all the God two language into God one language, but not in the sense of explaining it away as an atheist. He really thinks he is committed to the proposition. No, no, no. This will actually bring about you loving God, the intellectual love of God. It's, it's not an attempt to, you know, people, it's all just metaphorical. Or we're, we're just talking about the laws of the universe. And that's not. And that's what Carlyle's arguing. That's not what Spinoza is doing. He's trying, to, he's trying to say, look, we've got to have a conception of God that is deeper than the ultimate agent and the ultimate arena ultimate and this is Tillich's point too this the you know the god beyond the god of of, of theism is one of Tillich's great essays right like and he, he, people need to read it right they need to read it the god beyond the god of theism and the way he talks about it at the end of the courage to be this god that's beyond the god of theism is the re, re answer to the meaning crisis so what what i you can see this is really sort of just sparking like this, and this is why I'm reading all this stuff. Like this, this trying to get it. 
I would want to say to you <laughs> that the God beyond the God of theism, uh, I'm being provocative here, is that which lies below God number one and God no number two and properly relates and grounds them together, such that the agent and the arena relationship of our life is properly grounded and honed. Yeah. That's what I would want to say to you. Yeah. And I'll have to, I haven't read the essay, so I'll have to take a look at it. But that, that, I think, is the struggle that we're dealing with. And I think the struggle yeah. goes back to the Greeks. I remember, I, I've looked for it, but I can't find it. You know, part of what the Greeks, part of what you see in the Greeks, let's say, the, the, the development of the fates. Yes. So, so yeah. what, are, what are the fates? Because the, if, you look at, if, you look at Kaufman's, if you look at Kaufman's argument that, um, you know, there's this tension between the agent and the arena. Yeah. That in a sense, the Greeks try to resolve with the fates or you also see that the Greeks, you know, you have Nike victory. You, yes, you take yes. something like victory, which I think is is similar to, you know, you have experience, realization, transformation yeah. and, and you turn it into a God. And and that's that's a that's a that's a right move in terms of down below here trying to figure out how to conceptualize victory. But yes, then yeah. how, how then do we, well, we want victory and we need victory. And so yes. how then do we call victory to ourselves? Yes, of course, yeah. in the ancient world, you call victory to yourself by sacrificing to the God. And, you know, so you have a personal narrative relationship with the God in order to bring the God in and have the God, you know, bring yeah. victory to you. Um, now, what happens, obviously, you know, and I, I, I don't, I'm not anywhere near enough educated, but my suspicion is, you know, why does, why does science the way that we recognize it today, why does that develop in the West? If, if you have a full blown, if you have a full blown understanding of God, number one, that you are still living within when you're dropping balls from a tower <laughs> in Italy, yeah. you are doing yeah. theology. You properly are. And, and um, I think the successor to the fates is, are the platonic forms. And the platonic forms are a, a, an attempt to like, ground intelligibility uh, uh, and, and, and to say that they're, I'll use Jonathan's language, and this is what I mean by he's more radical than people realize. There are real patterns and there are real principles governing those real patterns. Um, and they, there is a deep connectedness, and, and, and Pearl makes this in his thinking being, classic, uh, uh, metaphysics in the classical tradition. There's a deep connectedness between intelligibility, being, and sacredness. Um, and, and, this is, and, and this is the platonic notion of the form. And, 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 the, and, the, and the interesting idea about it is you can even see in Platonism people wrestling with just the issue you made, because you have in Plato the forms are they're just well, the best analogy it's an only an analogy it's like the formulas of chemistry. There's these formulas and they they form a system if I can use a neutral word, and then you get the middle Platonists worrying about exactly that. Like, but, but how, but my relationship to this is so transformative and, and you get the move. Well, maybe they're, they're actually ideas in the mind of God, but then what you got to do is you got to really expand what you mean by God uh, to do this. And then, and then you, and then it goes on and on, but yeah, that move, right. So, so that, that move and, and what I see Neoplatonism doing, and I want to mention in, 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 in how I also see it in the Bible, and, and this will be maybe provocative right but what i see neoplatonism doing is trying to get below the agent in the arena with the notion of the one right the notion the one is somehow deeper than the agent in the arena and and, and you can get people like proclus and how it how it how it generates the personal gods but you can also get right damasius about how it leads to all this ineffable stuff and they're trying to get it and, and i want to put it to you that i see something and other people have noted this I see something similar going on in the Bible uh, as a book. Um, there's, this, there's this withdrawal of God in the Bible. God's walking around. I don't know what that means. I'm, I'm just saying how it's written. God's walking around and talking at the beginning of the Bible. And then like he, he withdraws and he withdraws and he, withdraws, and he he's withdrawing into 
movements in history and empires. And he, you know, and he speak, I mean, I've talked to Muslims about this and they're sort of freaked out by the Bible. It's like, where's God? Like he, he's like, he, <clears throat> as far as we can tell, putting aside the idea of the incarnation and Jesus being the logos, God speaks very infrequently in the New Testament at all, right? There, this is my beloved son and, and a few other things. And, and it's like, I feel like the Bible is even wrestling with that, right? They're, they're trying to wrestle with kind of a God number two that's, you know, like in Genesis and a God number one, which is really, I mean, Paul on Mars Hill, the God, it, we live and move and have our being, right? This, right? and the Bible, I think, is actually wrestling with that too. I, I, I agree. So you, obviously the story starts with, um, you know, God walking with the man and the woman in the garden. Yeah. And then the second scene, you have two brothers who are both sacrificing and, you know, God favors the one. And again, the language is so completely mysterious. Yeah. And so, you know, the hunger for God and the other and the hunger for the father's affirmation drives the one brother to kill the, bro the other brother. Yeah. And of course, then, but there is some coming and going because, of course, with Israel and Egypt, they have they have so forgotten. Well, you could do a lot with Exodus. <laughs> yeah. They have so forgotten the God. But it could very well be that they have forgotten the God because there are so many gods. Yes. And, you yeah. know, there's a God on the throne. So then, of course, the you have the desert wandering. And I always tell people in some ways the the tabernacle is sort of a, a God containment unit. I mean, you, because <laughs> you, you don't want him to break out because when he breaks out, you know, but so, and I think that's right. And then as you go then through the Hebrew scriptures, once Israel is, you know, you have God showing up outside of Babylon, and then it's like, well, wait a minute, you're, you know, you always had geographical gods. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're how are you here? And then you have this brilliant move by the Hebrew prophets of, no, God sent Babylon, in a sense, right. God sent the gods of Babylon down to destroy the temple. And it's yes. like, how does that work? And then, of course, for a Christian, you have the New Testament. Yeah. where you know god writes himself into the story and but then after yeah. you know after acts then god is then obviously regularly coming down through the spirit you know onto gentiles <laughs> yes <laughs> and but then of course the climactic you know apoc apocalyptic book at the end of the story where you know cover us you know the 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 great and the small of the earth plea to the mountains cover us from the face of the one on the throne and the lamb so no the very the bible is very much a conversation about about the god number two who walks and has conversations with abraham and you know will appear to david and david will sing love songs to him and david calls himself his son yeah. And then, uh, you know, the spirit and the incarnation and all of that. But yet also in the Bi within the Bible is still God number one. Yeah. When Joseph will say things like to his brothers, you know, you sold me into slavery. Do you have any idea how much I suffered because you, you idiots did this to me? You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And so you see, you see all through the Bible also this borderline, arenic agentic trying to work things out of the god of it's a, it's in a sense the god of karma you know this happened therefore it's god's will that doesn't leave christianity and yes. and that remains in it and and you see right, it all right. over the place this happened therefore it was god's will oh but that sometimes these things that happen are really bad and awful and, and that, of course, sets up a bunch of the stuff that Cosmic Skeptic was was wrestling course, with, right? as if Christians, you know, we're the ones that are actually in here praying, and then it doesn't work, and we're keeping our faith. You think you think we're blind to this dynamic? We yes. live personally with that tension, and that, of course, sets up, you know, you know, part of where so someone has a transformation, and then they can't help but feel it you know, both the absolute and the contextual. Yes. And, and it comes together in a transformation. I think that's, 
I think that's fundamental to a transformation. I agree. That you don't just say, oh, this kind of works for me. You, you say, everything is different now. The, the arena in which I am living has fundamentally changed because of this transformation and everything is different. And I'm willing, let's say case of Paul of Tarsus, I'm willing now to, my closest friends now want me dead and yeah. are in fact seeking my life. But th I'll take that because of this transformation and the new world I am now living in. And so I think as, as these transformations go from individual, because, you know, we're as human beings, these things go viral, you know, good things and bad things. I mean, even, yeah. even suicide can be a contagion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so these transformations, then they start to spark between us and then they start to develop into communities. And then, but of course, all those communities are going through history. I mean, this, this is religion. And in many ways, you know, I love how you put this here. You know, this is the human story. It is a story of, you know, these realization, transformation experience, but then sacredness always seems to long for the sacred. Yes, it does. And, and I think that's well put. I guess I want to ask you a question then. Um, uh, you seem to acknowledge the, uh, I guess, the plausibility of the, the, I guess, the proposal I made about that I see exemplified in somebody like Spinoza, to, to, independent of the degree to which he succeeded, about trying to get a, a language, a conceptual vocabulary, a, a, a theoretical grammar below, if, if that's even the right metaphor, below, between, beyond God one, God number two, like to try and that that, that is in some sense uh, uh, the ultimate. Um, and I, I'm wondering, because part of what, part, part of what I, and I think you saw it too, part of what happens is in the theist atheist debate is equivocation between God number one and God number two all over the place. And, and that, to my mind, that equivocation blocks the idea of, uh, 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 of God, I, I don't know what, what number to give to that. <laughs> Maybe God to infinity or something. I don't know what to what to call it. But but, but the the below beneath, right? Uh, the, the the deeper than you know. This is why you know Whitehead's bipolar, which is not a good. We maybe should call it dipolar, so we don't confuse it with the disorder. View of God is God is both ult the ultimate subject and the ultimate object, and that which lies beneath both of those and makes both of those the main possible. Spinoza doing the same thing. Thought and extension are just two different aspects of the fundamental uh, reality, and and so what I was what I what what I'm trying to do is to come up with what would that what would that language be like, um, it, it, such that I, I I'm trying to point below, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm also I, I, the image I have in my mind I'm doing my thing I, mean, I didn't mean to but the stereoscopic. Here's God number one. And you use this language sometimes, yeah, so it's yeah. fair. God, here's God number one, God number two lens. But you know, I want to actually see the depth. I want to see through them to the depth behind them. Yeah. And I want to know, I, I, and maybe this is impossible for me. Maybe I have to go through, uh, I, have, I would need to go through some transformation that I can't. But I want, to, I want to try and craft, know, participate in the crafting of the language that allows that stereoscopic vision, right, possible for us. Uh, because I, I see other people like Spinoza or Tillich in, you know, the God beyond the God of theism, and he's not advocating atheism. That's just a mistake. I, I want, they're onto something. And, you know, and they both, and, and they're, at, they're at different ends of modern theology. Spinoza is at the beginning. Tillich is near and towards, when some people say towards the end of it in some ways. I don't know what that means. But anyways, right, more recent. And they're both saying that that move is essential for responding to the meaning crisis that, and that like I, I pay attention to that claim and I want to like what do I need to do and, and what do I need to do transformity existentially conceptually in order to grok that in order I'm sorry that's from Robert Heinlein stranger strange line right in order to get it in a in, in, a, in a profound way that's part of how I see the project of non-theism and trying to put it into discussion with classical theism. I want to get that. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is making sense to you. I, I, oh I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm at, I'm at the very edge of 
like my thinking and where I am. But that's what I and I want to be able to I want to be able to understand like why is it like so the 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 the, the metaphors that are used in Buddhism and Taoism are very much agentic. They're spatial metaphors, the void, the way, right? And and then and the West are arenic. You're, you're saying yes, they're arenic. I meant arenic, sorry. Yeah, I meant yeah. arenic, not agentic. And whereas the West is very agentic, right? As you point out, and, and and I think, again, this is this is my response to pluralism, which you've already. I think they both have something to teach us about the sacred in some profound way. And again, the what I'm trying to do with non-theism is look through those two lenses, yeah. the Eastern and the Western lens. And I, I know this is audacious, but I, I, I'm provoked by you know by Spinoza and Tillich. And other people saying, but this, this is what you have to get in order to respond to nihilism, to the meaning crisis, et cetera. Sorry, I'm getting very passionate here. But no, that, no, 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 I, I get it. Keep going. You're fine. I, I don't ever, I, and I think, you know, just a few things. Number one, I, I can't, we never do it alone. Oh, of course, of course. So number one, we never do it alone. That's why I'm here talking to you. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. we never do it alone. Um, and, and I think deep within Christianity, I, you know, I, again, I, I'd see people and, and it's, it's absolutely appropriate and biblical to talk about the Holy Spirit being a gift. But I think what has happened in our culture is that that gift sort of became a possession of ours. And uh -huh. no, you are possessed by the spirit. It is nothing that it's a category mistake that you imagine you can possess or oh, well spirit. done, Paul. That's excellent. Well done. So, so that's one thing. And I also noticed in reading the New Testament, because of course I'm a minister, I read the New Testament all the time. The spirit is at least as much between us as within us. I, I'm so glad you said, I mean, I, you'll, you'll know that I'm, 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 I'm doing Lexio Divina with David Bentley Hart's new translation of the New Testament. Really? Yes. Interesting. Yes. Um, uh, is, does he talk in that language? Well, he, I mean, he's Eastern Orthodox, so there's Neoplatonic language, right, in his theology. And but he he also like the experience of God. He's really willing to use, uh, you know, experiences of sacred experiences, realization, transformation of sacred of sacredness from Eastern traditions uh, to talk about, you know, that God is ultimately bliss in some way. That's that's right out of Vedanta. That's right out of the Upanishads, right? Yeah. And he's happy to do that. And he still thinks. And, I, and I, I take him to be sincere that that is still very consonant with his orthodoxy in the, in the sense of Eastern orthodoxy. Um, and and it, it's been really powerful for me to, to do that because I, he's a very, I mean, he knows the Greek really well and he's very honest and he knows the, he knows the whole theological tradition and the Neoplatonism and, and the Middle Platonism that's around and the Stoicism. That he just, and so you're reading, when I read passages in, and, and sorry, I mean this to be, I mean this to be provocative in, in a good way, not in a derogatory way. The, old, the New Testament is weirder than I've ever read it before. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> it, it, well, oh, so, so then, so then, you know, we never do it alone. The spirit is between us. It is always a gift. Yes. And I think that's, you know, that's where people, that's where, especially ministers, because we are practitioners, yes. you know, it's always a gift that that sight is always a gift. But I think the fourth thing is that I think it, 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 it gets fundamental. It has to be fundamentally manifest in the, in, in where heaven and earth meet together. And so if, even though language and narrative, yeah. uh, poetry, these are all enormously powerful compression mechanisms. I think, I think action is finally even more powerful, a compression algorithm than speech because in action, heaven and earth meet. So I'm now going to say this word to you that picks up on it perfectly. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and, and so as I, you know, I, I'm, I'm encouraged because so then I, you know, when I think if you talk about if you talk to Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox about the Protestant Reformation, it's kind of like, oh, I wish we could have avoided that. And as a Protestant, <laughs> I say, I bet you we couldn't because yes. it was it was popping up in all kinds of places even before 
you know, Luther then was the earthquake, but Jan Haas and Wycliffe, yep, 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 all yep, those yep. tensions were there in the system. And all well, the Orthodox say, well, if you had always listened to us before, maybe we wouldn't have had it. Well, I, I can't answer any of those questions. Okay. And it's, I don't need to, but I do, I do think that, you know, it, we are living in an exciting time because I think we are sort of at the end of that long 500 year thing and we are coming into a new something and i i i like uh, just like you i've looked at the atheist theist debates saying this isn't this this isn't this isn't how this isn't how we are transformed exactly it's sterile yeah. I, I find i find a sterility into it in it um uh, and I, 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 it lacks the vitality, but but that bring, that bring, that leads me to a question I wanted to ask you, and I, I want to ask it to you in fellowship and friendship, and, and you know, and and, and and which is your argument of you know the spirit of finesse, and so I've, I've thought a lot about that, um, and you know I, I I tried to answer you honestly and critically um, in in the good sense of the word when you presented that argument. But is, I mean, my, 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 and, and, and if I get your argument wrong, please interject. But part of what you, you're saying is there's a spirit of finesse and um, relating to God as a person enhances the spirit of finesse. Um, and, and that's why we keep coming back to it. And you were very careful about, you know, you have to work, you have to, uh, you have to take care about idolatry throughout all of that. You said that. And I, I, I get that. And I, I'm not trapping you into any small box. And, and if I am, tell me. But I was thinking, because I'm thinking about Spinoza's claim about the intellectual love of God, and he means, but he doesn't mean intellectual the way we mean the word intellectual. Hmm. He means in, in the Neoplatonic sense as the intellect, right? Hmm. The, that, that the act of intellection, well, the scientia intuitiva in which we realize our deep participation in God. And, and, and the Carlisle book is all about that. Spinoza's religion is the, the 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 when we go from when we can when we when we go from reasoning it to realizing that everything is in God that's the big that's the, that's what brings about blessedness right and Spinoza called that's what he means by the intellectual love of God he doesn't again mean sitting at a cafe saying wordy things about God he means this profound experience realization transformation that brings about blessedness and as a response he thinks this is a better response to the meaning crisis than Descartes proposal of pursuing a kind of epistemic certainty etc cetera, etc cetera. now Spinoza also said and and and, and such a man would in, there's nothing he would try less to do than to, to get God to love him in return now, now, now just give me a minute <laughs> no, it's and the good. reason it's good. The, re, the reason he says this is he says to do that would be to subvert, he thinks of love as a virtue in, in both the moral sense and the empowerment sense. And to do that would, to, would, be to, to, would be to remove the virtue within love. Because if virtue is not for its own sake, then it is not virtue, right? And if you are loving so that you get loved back, then it's not actual love. And, and it, there's, there's, I think there's profundity there. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, well, the Bible seems to use lots of impersonal metaphor. Well, I'm reading Dionysus, like I do De uh, Lexio on Dionysus, you know, the names. And there's just as many impersonal names as there's personal. God's a rock, right? right? God's a light, God's a wind, right? And sometimes he's not a wind, right? And all this They're stuff. all very arenic. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I was thinking, is it not possible for people to fall in love with? Let, let, let me try this. Let me try this. So Aquinas, God is an, the ocean of being. And he's not even an ocean because that's a thing, but something like that. Right. But I know people who have a profound love of the ocean. Yeah. And, 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 and it's even properly, it can become properly spiritual for them. Uh, I, have, I have such a love for the wind. I don't know why, but it's just... And of course, that picks up on you know Barfield and the the double meaning of wind and spirit. And I would say, and, you know, and the Taoists have that love for the Tao. Um, is it not possible to have that kind of profound love 
um, to something that is not conceived of as a person? I think, well, let's talk about loves. You know, yes. C.S. Lewis had his, oh, actually the oh. audio book of C.S. Lewis's Four Loves, you actually, Lewis actually reads it, which is quite fascinating. Oh, wow. And Storge um, is, you know, we talk about phileo, agape, eros. The fourth yeah. one is usually not talked about much, which is storge, which is sort of affection. Yes. And I, I would say that, yes, we can, we can have love for arenic, um, for arenic entities, yeah. but I think part of what we want for that love, for what, what we, how we want, how do we want to act out that love usually yeah. with engagement? So I want to go into the ocean and I want to let the ocean have me yeah. and, and with the wind, I don't just want to think about wind in the abstract. I want to I go don't. into the wind and have it blow me and then push back on the wind. I, I want to couple with it. Yes. I want to couple with it. Yes. 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 And I, I think that's, I think there's, and, and in, in that sense, it's, it's very difficult to not personify and fall in love, you know, yeah. it, to I, I personify you. the wind in order to really share in a dance with it. And mm. to have the wind know me and me know the wind, you know, to, to love and be loved. I mean, it's, I think love always wants that, you know, reciprocity going back and forth. And, um, and, and I think that's part of the reason why, you know, we are, are the, we, we sort of put romantic love or interpersonal love at the heights because it is it is far more terrifying because once we are once we are relating to we, we agentify the ocean uh we agentify <laughs> the wind i mean we I, I don't know you know i love that conversation you had with jonathan because you know as jonathan said you go up a certain high and maybe up beyond you know we we can only imagine and there it sort of takes a an impersonal thing but as long as we're involved with any of this, I, I don't know that it is, it is, we are capable of really loving without interacting and having giving and receiving. Well, I don't know. Maybe I think that, I think that's part. You're being honest that I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and you're being thoughtful that I appreciate that. And, I, I, and I'm not trying to win an argument with you. No, that's I know that. I, 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 I trust you, John. You don't have to worry. So, so here, here's what, like, first of all, I, I, I take Spinoza's point to be clear, and people don't realize that, you know, Spinoza, he quotes the epistle of John uh, at the beginning of, like, one of his, one of his major works, right, because, because he, he, like, the, the, those who live in love, right, are, are live in God, he, he, and, he, uh, God and, and John's proposal that God is agape. And 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 and, 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 and Spinoza is using that when he's making this proposal because he's he's I think he's pointing to the the conception that well no agapic love is actually beyond right erotic and philia and agapic love doesn't doesn't look for reciprocity um and and and, and you, you know Jesus says that you know God's love is like the rain it falls on everybody it's not looking for reciprocity that's his perfection talking, yeah yes that's his telos. Yeah, yeah, which is really kind of an interesting way of talking about it. And isn't isn't there something agopic in what I'm proposing that when, you know, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound romantic and like Don Quixote or something, but, you know, when That's I'm a loving, wonderful book. <laughs> it is a wonderful book. It is a wonderful book, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm putting this as a question, right? Isn't Spinoza getting something right about virtue and agape by yes. not looking for reciprocity? Yes as being central to it? I don't know if it's not looking for it as much as not demanding it, but yeah. I think it still hopes for it. Mm. Mm. I, I don't think, I don't think love, mm. I don't think, I, I think love won't, I think love is disappointed with indifference. Hmm. Because let, let's say, you know, I love Yosemite National Park. Yeah. And any chance I get to take that little three and a half hour trip 
um, I'll go to Yosemite and I always take cameras with me and I'll annoy my family because I'll stop and my family will say, how many pictures do you have of that rock? <laughs> and in many ways, the rock is indifferent to me. I certainly know that, but, but part of me longs for a communion with, yep. with the arena. And, and I think it's in that way that spaces become sacred to us. And, and this is where I sort of pick up on Lewis in, in his book, Miracles, where the, the, the vision is that we, um, you know, we are the stuff of earth and the breath of God, and, yep. and nature is to be our sister. And, and we long to dance with her, but we have, we have become estranged from her because of our um, our hubris and our avarice. And so we have abused her. And so yeah, her. we yeah. have a prickly relationship with her. And, and then in, in the, you know, in the resurrection, I mean, I think part of, part of why Christianity can say, oh yes, the, the vision of God, but we are, we are not fine. You know, our, our telos is not finally merely seeing God, but God clothing us with the flesh of a new creation by which the relationship with our sister will now finally fully be healed. And we can dance with her like we dare not dance in this, in this world. And, and I, I, I want to be honest, that resonates with me. I mean, there, there's beauty in what you're saying, but I'm going to, I, I'm going to give to you another, uh, the other inkling. So I want to talk about when I'm reading Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings, and and the the, the the this scene is in the extended cut, but it's not properly given the the the, the momentousness it should. Uh, Sam and Frodo are in Mordor, and and they're they're it's just oppressive, and they're losing, and and this and the clouds part for a moment, and I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Sam sees the light of the stars, and he's he, the fact that the stars are above all of this literally and also in the in the sense of your time they, they 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 are untouched by all of this and none of this touches them and the fact that that's an aspect of reality gives him great comfort i also get that comfort and i think that's something that spinoza is also pointing to right that, that there's also a way in which i don't like this word but i'll, I'll say it, the, the impersonal right um can also give us tremendous hope i mean that's what tolkien's doing in that moment he's doing in that scene yeah. and, and i i i kind of like the proposition that you know truth and justice might be like well, what plato says they might be impersonal they might be beyond right the the vicissitudes of of her human personality and that's that's almost important to how they work and how they function. I don't know if I'm making my point well, but I'm trying. No, to... it is. It is, and that's true too. I, and and I think that's part of the reason why you know the psalmist, "You are my rock." Yes. You, know, you are my fortress, and you I put my trust. It's yes. and and that's you know in 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 some ways the Bible then is that 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 example from Lord of the Rings, you know, if you read it in the text, it's far more powerful in the text than it is in the movie. And exactly. Tim Keller, this minister in New York, in New York city, he tells the story that when he was being wheeled into surgery, right before they put him under, he didn't have a Psalm on his mind, like a Christian minister should. He thought about that moment in the text because, because Keller is a huge Tolkien file. And, yeah. and the light of the star smote him. But what's interesting, because of course it's Tolkien, the stars for Tolkien are, you know- Alive. Yes. Alive. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so I, yes. I, I think you're right in that there is a, I mean, when we say in the Psalms, God is our rock, we are, we, we are, we are leaning into a steadfastness from God that we often only experience in his arenic, in, in our experience of him as arenic. That's that well this put. does that's not well change. That's, that's and, well and part of the terror of, of, re, of personal relationship is, and you hear that in other Psalms, oh Lord, why are you so far from me? 
Why do the wicked triumph and and the good are squashed? And and actually, you know, the the Old Testament is full of that. And, and you know, also in the Old Testament, of course, you have law, which is also kind of a, a post agentic arenic yeah. actualization. But yet we always know that law law event law comes to an end because there must be a judge because law itself is too low resolution to to finally I agree all with that pieces for what they are now you 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 said that eloquently in awakening from the meaning crisis that was a powerful point and and so this i think you're exactly right that this we at some point we we long to get beyond the agent arena relationship and, yeah. and we have an intuition that the arenic and the agentic will meet. Yes, yes. Well, this is well put. This is well put. I, I like that. So, so let me try I, I, again. Let me move it into. Uh, I think we're making progress. I feel we're making progress. Uh, if you feel that I'm just belaboring something, then let no, me know. Not at all. So, and I grew up with this, and and, and I think this is a fairly prevalent thing for Christians. So, they love the Bible, and the Bible is holy. And it's like, I don't like, like the Bible, like the, the Bible isn't the person. And, but what I mean is there's a, there's a love there and there's an attribution of sacredness, even of the sacred to this, let's be fair, this impersonal object. And don't say, well, it's a story about people. That's not the point. That's not the point. I can have a rock carved with word that or, this is not a person. Right. Um, but, but especially the church I was brought up in, it, it, you know, and, and I've heard, I've heard Catholics, sometimes mean spirited, sometimes loving spirited, talk about Protestants having the paper Pope, that the Bible is basically like the Pope, they treat it like a person that makes pronouncements. And it's like, no, it's not, it's a book, right? Uh, and then, but now to, to, to try and make it more fair, right? I have the same relationship to Plato's Republic. I love this. One of my best friends is Plato's Republic. And it's sacred to me because of the way I described. It has been constant. It has been trustworthy in its ability to afford reciprocal opening and grow with me as I grow. I'm reminded of another part of the Psalms where the deep calls to deep. And Plato's Republic has never failed to do that for me. Now, it doesn't mean I can just sit back and look at it. I have to participate in it. But, but see what I'm trying to get at? I'm, oh, trying yes. to get at? I'm trying to get at with both within and without Christianity. Again, this, this, we can have this profound love and, and we want to attribute a, a, even a sacredness to that, a holiness to it, because what we're in relationship with is constantly doing that with us. Yeah. So that, I, 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 that's another example. I wanted, I wanted to get your re re reflections and response on that. I, I'm very happy that Protestants have not gone so gone so far to say the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Scripture. <laughs> but that is a constant, that is a constant issue in Protestantism. Okay. That in some ways the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church don't quite have those issues. I, right. I get into regular conversations with respect to um icons, for example. Yes, yes. And so, so, Cal so Calvin, one of the things that Calvin dealt with, you don't, the, the scriptures, and this is the language we use in the church, the scriptures don't come alive for you apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. And right. in that way, right. Calvin tries to keep the sola scriptura, keep the Bible from becoming an idol. Right. And in many, in, in, with Protestants, often the Bible, Protestants will use the Bible idolatrously, right? But right. the Bible is always supposed to be, um, you know, it, it's supposed to guide us to God. The Bible is not God, mm -hmm. and you know, as a Protestant, it's it's really important to say that. Now, again, part of what I think happened with the Protestant Reformation is there was there was just a sense that. There, there, stuff had accumulated in the church and there needed, there needed to be a scraping done. There needed to be some housekeeping done. Now, as is almost always the case with human beings, we, we use our agency 
we, we don't use our agency well, even with the best intent, even. Yes, and, yes. And because we simply, and Gandalf, um, you know, says that beautifully to, to Frodo when, when in the minds of Moria. Yeah, yeah. You know, Frodo's, I wish, I wish Bilbo had killed Gollum. And, and, and Gandalf says, are you able to, you know, give life and take it? Now, obviously, the thing for human beings is, well, we give life in this, you know, rather unscientific drama, but we <laughs> take it with ruthless self-righteousness. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that's figuring out our relationship with the Bible is and, and is a is a difficult thing, but at least with Calvin, it was always the Bible is a tool used by scripture and, and just functionally in a community, it's helpful to have a canon. Yet, if you live within that community, you very quickly realize that there's some parts feel a little more canonical than others. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds almost like a George Orwell statement there. <laughs> yes. and, and so what, what happens is then that there's sort of an epigenetics on top of the genetics that sort of, yeah, you know, yeah. go with the Bible and traditions and, yeah, it's, 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 it's totally messy. It's totally messy. Um, and, but, you know, so Peugeot and Richard Rowland was doing a, um, a conversation about icons and Richard Rowland had been a reformed Baptist and went to reformed Baptist seminary. And there were these statues outside the seminary and pictures in there of, you know, former lights of their tradition. And he's like, these are icons. These are, you know, these yeah. are, yeah. So it's it's this human it, it's our humanity that we we can't we can't help but be who we are and and again for for me in terms of my Calvinism that's why I, I appreciate my tradition in that you know finally fully it's God's gift to us um, and it doesn't mean we don't have work to do but but even you know back to moments of transformation. Again, I find it, people will talk about the path that led up to it, but almost always at sort of at the moment of, of release, it, it, so, it so feels like giftedness. That, that, and that's used by the, the people who are in the flow state. By the way, Chick Setmahai passed away. Oh. Yeah, just to, just to. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's a, a great loss. So let me ask you a question that's both philosophical and asking as a friend. I, I mean, I, I know what Calvin might say, but I'm wondering what you say. My, my, my relationship to the Republic, it, it, would you consider that idolatrous? No. Right, right. My relationship, I mean, there are times when I read C.S. Lewis and I think, am I, am I thinking he should be in the Bible? And then I read other C.S. Lewis, like, oh, good thing he isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so we all, you know, we can't help but, we can't help but fall in love with, with, with places, you know, I love Yosemite National Park. Um, you know, there are there are some places, you know, Calvin College for me, I spent years on that campus. That's sacred ground for me in some ways that I go there and it's it's not like other places. And it's just how we are. We, 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 I don't think that, I don't think there's anything that we should be ashamed of. I mean, look at Dante's Divine Comedy, you know, yeah. Virgil. <laughs> <laughs> Look what yeah, yeah, yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 Christians, there's this weird thing where on one hand, God is a refining fire and he's holy and yes. you can never measure up. On the other hand, God is enormously generous. And, and, and so, you know, God's perfection in the father's perfection in the sermon on the Mount, he sends the rain to fall on the fields of the just and the unjust. Yes. That's, and and yeah. be perfect and that's so often i'd hear in protestantism that be perfect was always in this peculiar narrow rigid but yeah. then well why don't you actually look at the text yeah it's exactly this radical exactly. generosity which yeah. to me again is what you know the cent the, the, the central moment of of christianity well moment incarnation you know crucifixion resurrection ascension it's all one drama but at, at the center is someone who is being brutalized by his, his creation. 
And he says on the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And so even, even in the relationship between the son and the father, there's this dialogue. Mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, I, it's, it's a difficult dynamic to figure out how to live with on one hand, this, you know, a, a, the most, the, the most rat, the most absolutist demand coupled with the most irresponsible generosity. And I think it's, it's those yeah. qualities that we see in Jesus. That is the reason. I mean, Tom Holland in one interview notes, he says the fact that they were able to construct a text that presents a character which has been fresh and, you know, a transformation inducing, not just for the first century and that they were written, but, you know, yeah. across cultures and through time. And in fact, that four people did this about the same person. It's, it's, to me, it says something about I don't know. Peterson has good language about it. He says, oh, that's archetypal. You can't get around it. And that's, that's how I feel about that story often. So. And, 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 and you should, I mean, I, I, I like, I, I'm not trying to challenge or deny that. What I was trying to get at was just as like, there's an intuition that the agent and the, uh, uh, and the arena, there's something below them. I'm wondering if there, 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 there is, there's an impersonal and personal form of finesse, and there's something below that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people have uh, have have coined this term transpersonal, and, and they're trying to get clear about what it means. Um, but it, it, it's it, and I'm thinking that those two, they fit inside each other. I'm not quite sure what the which fits inside which. That's what I've been trying to. That's what I've been trying to gesture towards. Um, and I see. You know, I'm reading Nicholas of Cusa right now, and he's playing with that a lot. He's playing. He he sets these oppositions up, and then you sort of you sort of you sort of do massive frame breaking because neither one of like you know he'll he'll, he'll first just use a geometrical example. Like, okay, so I have a circle, and as I expand the circle, the arc gets less and less. So an infinite circle is a straight line, and your mind goes bang. It's like a Zen koan. And then he does the same thing in the vision of God. He does the same thing. He said, you know, the transcendence and the imminence. Try and do that with them. Each one is undermining the other, and yet somehow if you get the bang, then you're getting the actual thing. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to I'm trying to do exactly that move. And again, this is this has been sort of the guiding impulse in what I call non-theism. That's yeah. that's what yeah. I keep trying to do again and again and again. You know, I when I look at so if you read Matthew, it's the kingdom of heaven, and Mark and Luke, it's the kingdom of God, and John, it's eternal life, which is it's a life of the age yeah. um, in Greek. But Paul has in Christ. Yes, yes. He he almost he 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 makes christ a renic yes he does which and, is and, really interesting yes and 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 uh, i think it's carlisle uh spinoza actually cites paul trying to pick up on that and he uses that when he makes his proposal that being in god is the fundamental ontological thing we have to get we have to recognize again not just intellectually propositionally we have to recognize it transformatively we have to transform so that we can come into the best possible conformity to that reality that is possible for human beings right we have to realize it yes exactly exactly, exactly. <laughs> that exactly. it is it is finally realization and and so you know i think for christians christ is of course that yes Yes, it's yes. heaven and earth coming together. And then for the Christian, I mean, someone made a comment about they thought I had some weird, strange name for my church. And I said, well, read first, we're free first Peter two, because Christ, who is the living stone. Yes. yes. And then we then are living stones and we are built into a temple. So if you if you're paying attention to this agent arena relationship, it's all over the New Testament. Yes, yes, that's well said. That's very well said. It's very well said. Wow. 
this I'm finding this conversation very helpful. So thank you for it. Well, thank you. I mean, I I I have I have so benefited from your work. And look, more than just more than just your work, your person, because you have, you know, I have seen in you, I mean, we're, I mean you and I have never met in the flesh. We're, yeah. We always have yeah. this media <laughs> between us. But, you know, I have seen in your work, um, you know, someone who is um, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And by righteousness, I don't mean a conformity to a list of yeah, you know, yeah. narrow precepts, but Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Comedy, you know, he, he's trying to get at this Dikaio Sune. And when I read, so Dallas Willard, he taught philosophy at University of Southern California. And uh, he passed away just a few years ago. But so he taught, he taught phenomenology, he was a Husserl expert. Oh. And he, um, he wrote, he wrote this book, The Divine Comedy, which very much gets at, he was one of the f- sort of revivifiers of Christian practice, intentional practice. Mm. And I, you know, I've read his book, The Divine Comedy, a number of times. It's one of these books that I go back to regularly. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that he did in that book was he, he mentioned Dikaio Sune, and then he started connecting it with Plato, which right. sort of prompted me to, oh, I want to, I want to take a look at Plato's Republic and the Greek. And I want to, you know, I want to yeah, yeah, yeah. play around with this stuff. And, and so for me, you know, Dallas Willard sort of helped me connect some of these things. Okay. What on earth is this, is this righteousness that we read about in the gospel of Matthew? And, and of course, in the Beatitudes, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then just the, you know, the absolute radical statement that Jesus makes and they will be satisfied. Yes. Yes. You know, that's, you know, on one hand, quite rightly, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, trying to get at this is sort of like trying to get at the, the problem of the exclusive and the inclusive. And, yeah. you know, in sort of yeah. a Hegelian way, we decide, <laughs> oh, there's a, but, but, you know, Chris, when Jesus says those kinds of things in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Um what a radical pronouncement and what a, you know, what a word of hope. And I get that. I don't know if I can ever get that from Yosemite Valley. Mm. 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 And, and one of the things that was interesting in the, in the Bishop Barron unbelievable thing was Bishop Barron kept coming back to God speaks. Now, you know, Yosemite Valley certainly does speak to me. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glories of God. Mm -hmm. Um, day after day, they pour forth speech. And so in many ways I go to Yosemite Valley and it's a sacred place for me. And it speaks to me of glory and grandeur and patience and, and also danger, you know, there's wild animals there and I meet bears in Yosemite, but, um, you know, to, to, to have, to, to be given a word of hope that those who hunger and thirst for Dikaio Sune, they will be satisfied. And, you know, Mm. And uh, if I can live into that and say, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. so so I watch transformations around me and they're stepping over lines that make me anxious. And I watch people in process and I, I'm watching this very live, this very live community around me in multiple communities. But but now within me, and again, I, I think I think you really need an agent to say. And I loved how you said it in that video, being is good. Yes. yes. Wow. Do I dare hope that? On what basis can I, can I responsibly maintain that hope? Because if being is good, that's going to have entailments in terms of my actions. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, that, that my life isn't just, you know, zero to 80 or 90, and I have to try and in, a, in whatever hedonistic, even moral hedonistic way, squeeze all the goodness out of it so I can experience it. But that, you know, somehow, and this is where you get into the upper register, somehow I can't but imagine that maybe somehow I participate in something that won't simply end with the termination of, of this heart and this body. And I don't know, I mean, and this is, and, and if in fact being is good, <laughs> Might I not take time and sit with 
the homeless or the schizophrenic or the poor, you know, not just jigger the economics and maybe help them have more stuff, but might I not, um, and, and uh, one, might I not be able to lend some of that agency to them? I, I get, I get it. I, I think, um, uh, um, it was a, I forget which video conversation I was saying, you know, when, when you're with somebody who's lost someone to death, there's nothing you can say. What you have to do is be there beside them yeah. as a, like you have to be present. And I get what you're saying about that. I, I do. I hear what you're saying that there, there's that kind of connection that only, only a person can provide for us. Yeah. Um, and, and, and um, I see, I, I see the truth in that. I guess for me, I, I, I guess I'm wrestling with the question and I'm not trying to like make a confession to you or anything. I, I'm, I'm wrestling with the question of whether or not people have genuinely profoundly personal relationships to things that are not properly thought of as persons because persons are bounded spatial temporal things, um, they're, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems, to, I, I see, I'm proposing to you that maybe the Bible is actually suggesting that, and and and, and, and Plato and Spinoza are are arguing that we can, in fact, enter into deeply personal relationships. To I don't know what to call it because it's not a being, right? To, to uh, you know, ontological placeholder here to write some, some ultimacy, some really realness that is not properly thought of as a person, and it's not properly thought of as not a person. That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm, and that 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 and 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 that again the stereoscopic that we like we we have a impersonal personal relationship to this thing that is neither a person nor not a person and 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 that and the wisdom is trying to coordinate those together in a life that's well lived and and again that's what I keep trying to come back to yeah and and, and, and you 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 just you just did both sides of that yeah right. You, you, we're in Christ, but you know, Jesus is like somebody who can sit beside you when you're grieving. Yeah. And I get that. And I get that. And, I, and, I'm, try, and I, I'm, I'm trying to honor that, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to say, but I, I'm trying to say why I still am committed to what I'm seeing as non-theism yeah. because yeah. I see it as trying to make this question, the central, uh, I guess I'll use this adjective, the central philosophical theological question. That's what, that's, that's what I, that's what I, that's what I'm trying to say, I guess, finally. Well, I don't know that, that Bishop Barron's non-theism is impersonal. And so I yeah. don't know that non-theism is necessarily impersonal. I, I agree with you on that. I don't, I don't uh, know. It's a question. But the, the problem I have uh, with the adjectives and then you in the, this comes up when you did it with the Bible, right? And, and there's ways in which we can make personhood an idol, uh, be, because the meaning I have for that term is of things. You and I are things in the ontological sense. I don't mean in the moral sense. That's ridiculous. Right. But it, right. So all uh, uh, here, I can I can say this very confidently. All the people that I've met <laughs> have been things, and so for me to try and say, well, I have a personal relationship. Um, to something that is properly no thing, I'm trying to work out what that means because it yeah. it isn't it isn't easily resolved. Yeah. I know what you mean by when you say Bishop Barrett's relationship isn't impersonal, his non theism, but I wonder if it's also properly called personal or if it's something somehow beyond both of them yeah. in an important way. Well, I, I, I might be pushing you, and I don't mean no, to. no, no. You're not pushing me. I, I I think you know I think it's it's easy for us to imagine that our grasp on on the personal is limited by our capacity and experience of the personal. Yes. I mean, we can sort of level up imaginatively, but that's always sort of, you know, if you have a camera or a phone, you have the, you have the, you have the, um, the physical zoom, and then you have the digital zoom and the digital yeah. zoom is always crummy. Um, <laughs> you know, you said, you said persons are bounded temporal things. And I don't know that that's true. And part of why I, right, I don't right. know that that's true is because on one hand, you are a thing, 
and we both agree with that, but there's something about you that is more than a thing. And we, we completely recognize that with each other. Yes. And, and what that moreness is, 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 is terribly difficult to articulate. But again, to pull a Peterson, we act as if that you have moreness and I have moreness. And when we don't act as if people have moreness, Oh, <laughs> no, we, we should. We should recognize that. Although I think there's a way in which everything has moreness and everything. Yeah, has sadness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but and, but then to, to sort of the to what degree are we bringing? Are we lending? So so when I sit down, when I work with one of these homeless addicts. Yeah. What, what I do in a very strange way is I bit by bit in tiny little increments, I lend my agency to them. Yes. Yes. How much yes. of it they can accept and sort of internalize and take and then help them grow more agency. Well, that it's a very slow process, but it, it could be that in fact, that's some of what we do with our sister. Um, we, yeah. we, and, and it, this stuff is just so, it's just so hard. It's so difficult, but it, we, it, it is. And, 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 and you're right. And I hope I'm not, presenting my ideas in a hubristic way. We should approach them with humility and, and, and proper humility. And, and I, I, I'm trying to formulate, I'm trying to formulate non-theism as you know, properly um, exploratory in, in this way that we're doing here. Um, uh, and and as, a, as a provocation to uh, reflection and dialogue um, and, and trying to break out of the straight, this, yeah. really, this, the sterile straitjackets that we find ourselves in. And I've been finding this conversation extremely helpful, both, uh, both uh, you know, philosophically and personally, because the, these issues that I'm talking about, uh, and I'm, I'm like, these issues, they, 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 they stand on the border between impersonal philosophical reflection and personal involvement and transformation, yeah. and, and properly so. I mean, that's where they should be placed. And so I'm wrestling with this, uh, and I see that you are too, um, and, and, and we both have, we both have loyalties. We don't want to trespass against and, 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 and respect, we're respecting that in each other, but yeah, I, 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 I like the, the combination of the profundity of this and the humility that we have to bring to us. I think we can agree that's largely missing from a lot of the public debate between theism and atheism on both sides. That's something yes. I would want to say. Absolutely. And I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. There's there's a weird, so obviously in, in Christian theology, there's 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 very there's very binary language about Christian and not Christian. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you've yeah. you've certainly got that language. And I don't mean to displace that or um or undermine that. That's one thing in Christianity, but Christianity also flips the other way. When Jesus says of the centurion, surely I've not found anyone with such faith in Israel. Yes, yes. I, you know, it, it's, it's a minor miracle that he wasn't stoned at that moment, given the political religious context he was in. Of course, of course. And, and so there's all these tensions that so in my own Dutch Calvinist tradition, there's two big things that came out of Abram Kuyper in the Netherlands. He was this Dutch polymath at the beginning of the 20th century. One was common grace and the other was the antithesis. And the antithesis is actually black, white, light, dark. It's the binary. And then common grace is, you know, this God sends his grace upon everyone in the world. And yeah. well, how can you have a system that has these two things together? Well, it's really hard, but the truth is there's lots of these systems that we all live with with and yeah, 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 don't do yeah. without. And so yeah. um in I find in in the Christian faith both a both language that says, I mean, I'm a Calvinist for Pete's sake, language that says I was chosen by God from the foundation of the earth, completely apart from any works that I might do. On the other hand, um, you know, this God's radical generosity, that same message says. You didn't do a darn thing, and he loves you, regardless. Right. And he's right. he is he is drawing you and transforming you and taking you to himself. 
and and he will not be frustrated by any power on earth and you know all that absolutism is like oh gosh then you watch calvinists and you know they don't act like it's all cut and dried they're, they're playing all their <laughs> youth, stupid human games anyway so, so. so and and so you know many of these things um many of these Many of these things I think we will continue to bump up against, struggle with, but you know what I'm so encouraged by you, John, and by you know what we've what we found in this little corner on the internet. Um, you know, I didn't know we could I didn't know we could do this. Yes, yes, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, and, and I borrowed a word from Christianity um, the, 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 to try and remind people of this. The, the notion of fellowship, which is not friendship, and is not partnership, and is not family, fellowship, and the possible and the and the necessity of bringing back the recognition of the importance of fellowship for proper human life and development. Um, and so, um, the fact that dialogos can occur in fellowship between people who will all well, you know you and I don't come to some final agreement we come to some things we agree on you give some ground I give some ground but there's things we won't let go of yep and that's the way it should be I mean yep. uh, and that's what I meant earlier when I said I wasn't trying to win an argument with you I was really wanting to hear what you had to say about this knowing that I probably wouldn't fully agree with it but knowing also that you that you because you are outside of my position you have the ability to pull me in a direction I couldn't go on my own. And I value that. I love it. I appreciate it um, uh, uh, profoundly. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah the, the, the fact that this is occurring and the fact that it's occurring more and more in this corner of the internet. And, and you know, Savella just, need, we should all be paying her royalties for that phrase, by the way. Yes, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> um, I, I, that, this is just really profound for me. I, yeah. I should get going soon, but yeah. I, I, just, I just wanted to thank you and the, I, uh, uh, for this. I, I mean, you afforded me trying to make very clear what I mean by non-theism and why it shouldn't be seen as just a sort of weak atheism. It's something other, and I'm trying to point that out. Um, I'm trying to point out the at least the the potential dialogical value it has, um, and, and and you've seemed to be acknowledging that at, at certain at certain parts in the conversation. I think sincerely, um, and so um, I just wanted to thank you for that because I wanted to try and get clear what my motivation is and what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to talk about uh, with this, this language and who, I'm, who I want other people to read and think about. And I wanna also, I wanted to, uh, to take the opportunity to admit a, a mistake I had made. I, I, I named the thing I was uh, uh, you know, opposing to atheism, classical theism, and I, 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 sorry, the thing I was opposing to non-theism as classical theism, and that's a mistake. That's clearly a mistake. And, uh, and I wanted to explore what making amends for that mistake would look like. And you've helped me to do that a lot. And I really appreciate that. Well, I, I, I again, I'm, I'm super appreciative, John, for what you've done and who you, but especially who you are. Um, because you're, in each of our stories, people who watch this will, will connect to us. And, you know, I know that you have, you have helped a, a lot of people um, break out of some things and experience some transformations and continue on in the conversation. And, you know, I, I, I see part of what we're doing as the continuation of civilization. I mean, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. Taking, we're taking these ancient conversations and they're being revivated. They're, they're, they're alive again amongst us and and influenced by kind of Plato and Spinoza and John Calvin and Abram Kuyper and you know yeah. Verveke and Vander Clay and it's I I feel tremendous gratitude for being able to participate in this it's wonderful me too thank you very very much I will end the recording now and I will send you this video and um, I'll probably post mine tomorrow morning and I'll post mine probably sometime soon too so again okay. thank you very much Paul I mean uh, Beyond the intellectual discussion, the, the, the fellowship was, was much appreciated. Yeah, I agree. Amen. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.